I don't want to live on this planet anymore. And you know, Mars... Mars is not exactly inviting looking. Is it really possible that there are no other readily habitable globes in the heavens? Surely there's one out there somewhere. For every grain of sand on Earth's beaches, there's at least 10 stars in the universe. And you figure, there's at least one planet on average around those stars, if not more. So there's gonna be more planets than stars. Surely there's gotta be something out there somewhere, an extrasolar Earth. So where are all those planets? We, we need to find them. Scientists are developing new techniques to find these extrasolar planets all the time. I mean, we've got a lot of data, we just don't know how to reliably find extrasolar Earths in the data that we have. It's a tricky problem. One technique involved the development of a coronagraph, which revealed four Jupiter-sized planets orbiting a star. Now, this took almost a decade of observations. We don't, we don't have that kind of time. Another method is called the transit method. Basically, what this does is it looks for a star and then it looks for the star to periodically dim. And based on how much it dims and how often it dims, you can sort of figure out how big the planet is, you know, sort of where it is. And the really cool thing about this technique is that you can use imaging arrays and image a bunch of stars all at once. Just take a ton of observations. You can do thousands or tens of thousands of stars, whatever you can fit in a field of view. So this is, lends itself to uh, numerical analysis, data analysis, big data analytics, or whatever you want to call it, in order to find extrasolar Earths. The problem though is that Earth isn't really that big. So the amount of dimming that you'll see from a planet size to Earth, eh, you know, stars are analog critters. They're gonna dim and brighten on their own. Enter the Lowell Observatory. The Lowell Observatory is an independent nonprofit research institution founded in 1894 by Boston mathematician Percival Lowell. It's near Flagstaff, Arizona. Scientists at Lowell University and Yale University have built something they call the Extreme Precision Spectrograph. This is one of the first instruments where scientists actually expected to have the level of precision necessary to locate extrasolar Earths that meet the criteria and that, uh, you know, are not super gas giants or anything like that, that have a pretty dramatic local dimming effect. Now at the Lowell Observatory, they're already collecting reams and reams and reams of data. In fact, they're having a little bit of a data overrun issue. Uh, it turns out if you can't process a day's worth of information in less than a day, typically way less than a day, uh, pretty soon you're going to be overrun with data. You're going to be drowning in data. The data really needs to be processed quickly and also distributed to other research scientists around the world. You know, Yale University, they're, they're, they're not just sitting around. They need that process data in order to do their analysis and research. Data overruns, a giant mess of data, drowning in data. Sounds like they could use a computer janitor. So I've been talking to Dr. Joe Lama about precisely what sort of computer janitorial services they require, because I am at their disposal. So while astronomers are looking for planets around other stars at night, we still need a good model for how stars behave. I mean, searching for an Earth-like exoplanet around, you know, a star like our sun, definitely needle in haystack territory. So if we had a better model of our sun, it might help us do that. So this instrumentation is used during the day and at night for collecting different kinds of data. Yeah, Dr. Lama is running the experiment for the solar collection aspect of it, and NASA has already collected 2.8 petabytes of information. So the hope is that this massive volume of information might be just the, uh, <laughs> the first chapter of an epic tale about human space exploration and finding the first habitable exoplanet. I got a plan, but I got to call in some favors. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's for a good cause. They're a nonprofit. We could really, I mean, you know, we could really get a lot done. Oh, great. Thanks. That's, that's awesome. I really appreciate it. I'm sure they will, too. It's, uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Good news, everybody. Well, I've got a plan, and my plan is to process that data as close to real time as possible. As soon as the data comes in, process it and get an indexed compressed version of the data stored on a high speed storage array, something like flash memory. Now, we're going to keep the original data on a spinning rust you know, hard drive array that is local to the server so we could quickly, pretty quickly, load information from that you know, mechanical storage because hey, 18 terabyte hard drives are a thing and 18 terabyte flash drives are, those are expensive. So we can reload any data that we need from the local storage array. If we need sort of even more storage that'll fit in a single chassis because 200 gigabytes a day doesn't, you know, even 18 terabytes doesn't last all that long or 18 terabytes times 12 drives. Uh, we can offload that extra storage for networking. And so in addition to storing the information that we process as close to real time as possible, probably also gonna deploy a couple of containers on the server so that other research scientists can make a request, you know, fill out a web form basically, and then be able to get any other information that they need and download it in real time. This is probably gonna be an ongoing process, probably gonna end up seeing a couple of videos about this and the other stuff that goes into it. So now we wait. Well, that was stealth. I think it's time for a build. As our Voltron montage implied, Gigabyte and AMD have really contributed generously here. We cannot thank them enough. Without them, this project would not have been possible. And Keoxia also kicked in for some flash storage. We're using their CM6 Enterprise SSDs for our storage array. And we got four of them as configured in this chassis. So we're gonna be able to process data as close to real time as possible thanks to this flash array. The final build has two 32 core Epic processors and one terabyte of RAM. Some of you at home have 512 gigabyte SSDs. This computer has one terabyte of RAM. Now with this hardware, we can process a full day's worth of data in much less than a day. So we can catch up on all the data that sort of overrun everything else and also be able to really quickly reprocess data whenever they change the algorithm. The centerpiece and crown jewel of the plan here is of course the Gigabyte G482. This is a research scientist's dream server. It's for you, you know, a lot of the time the data center, they're after the most compact machine possible. But this chassis is one of the most flexible enterprise chassis that I've ever seen. It combines NVMe, three and a half inch storage. There's even two and a half inch SATA storage. And we've also got all the PCI Express connectivity that we'd ever need. Now we don't have an algorithm yet that'll take advantage of GPUs or FPGAs or anything like that. So all of the heavy lifting here is down to AMD Epic. And the 32 core monster CPUs that we have in this chassis are gonna cut through that data really quickly, no problem. The 32 core CPU sort of balance high clock speed and uh, core density for sort of the, the sweet spot for this particular algorithm looking for our extrasolar Earths. Now there's still plenty of room for optimizations and fine tuning and future videos with level one, but let's check in with Dr. Lama and find out a little bit more about the Lowell Observatory, his team and the goings on so that we can sort of have fun and live vicariously. So I've got Dr. Joe Lama here with me. Hello and welcome. You're live from the observatory. Hi, Wendell. How are you? Great to see you. So, uh, you know, this thing is a lot of horsepower. 
a ridiculous amount of horsepower, and you are gathering data almost faster than, than we can really store it, because, you know, you and I were working together and looking at some stuff and, and that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, walk us through it. Like, what is the deal with this level of data? It's absolutely bananas. And you're using the telescope during the day. Yeah, I'm doing everything backwards. Um, I'm definitely a social hour astronomer, not a nighttime astronomer. So yeah, you know, when uh, we first started this project, we didn't really think too much about, you know, the computing needs of this. It was sort of, oh, here's a cool idea. Let's go do it. And we'll kind of figure out the details later. And in, in you know, as you well know, those things come back and haunt you. Uh, so, <laughs> but yeah, you know, we have this one star up during the day, the sun. Uh, no, none of my colleagues are vying for telescope time. They all just want to use the nighttime. So I've got unobstructed access to the telescope all day, every day, pretty much. Uh, so, yeah, and as you say, that generates a lot of data. Well, I mean, it wasn't just you, though. I mean, it was like I was doing some of the prep material for this, and, and NASA, and one of the things you sent me is like, it's like, oh, yeah, NASA, NASA just casually dropped, oh, yeah, we've got like a petabyte of data on the sun during, you know, daily observation. And it's like, okay, there's something to this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the sun is just, you know, it's, it's so close by. You know, all the other stars you see in the night sky are just these point sources. And while we can collect a lot of data on them, they are still just point sources. And there's a lot of, things that happen between us and those stars that prevent us getting uh, as much data as we can on them. So, you know, stars like the sun, it's it's this really cool opportunity to uh, to look and just understand what's going on inside these, these big fireballs. Uh, it's really, really a cool opportunity. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we've, we've already been sort of testing the server a little bit with some data sets and, you know, running through that. And, um, you know, it really is like a like a buzzsaw just cutting through the data. I mean, AMD Epic and what Gigabyte has put together uh, in this chassis, they, they really sort of carry it home as far as data processing in real time and like whatever crazy software and algorithms and stuff like that that you guys come up with. It really is crazy to think that this might be the machine that finds, you know, a, a planet where and it's like, oh, we need to look more closely at this oh, we're getting polarized light from this planet. Maybe the plants on the planet are absorbing the other polarization of light. You know, there's, it's possible. Oh my God, yeah, it's so true. Um, yeah, we can't thank Gigabyte enough. This is way more computing power than uh, we ever thought we'd we'd get access to or maybe we'd even need. But, uh, you know, when, uh, when someone gives you a hammer, you find the nail to, to hit the problem with. So yeah, we will throw everything we've got at this machine. Uh, I'm well, really and excited. You know, it's not just the, you, you guys aren't just collecting data for yourselves either in the project. I mean, you've got a lot of other uh, higher education and other researchers that you're feeding the data to. So it's not just, you know, your group this depends on. I mean, there's there were some pretty big names in there. Yeah, that's right. So uh, what we want to do is, you know, make this data as open as possible. So all of my colleagues around the world can, you know, download it and have a crack at beating this problem we have of trying to tease out the tiny signals from orbiting planets. Yeah, you said, um, I think on the existing system that when you're running data processing and like you bring up the terminal, you would you would type a few things and then like a few seconds later, it would sort of go across the screen. <laughs> it's like using dial-up internet. Uh, that's uh, the thought <laughs> process I had. <laughs> oh, the, the load average is 150. Is that is that good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this this does quite a, this, this will cut through that with... Uh, uh, quite a bit more ease than the uh, than the existing setup, and we can also scale it. Yeah. So, in terms of like making that data accessible and dealing with that on the software side, um, we're looking at doing that with containers, and that is something that we can revisit in a in a follow up video. I'm sure I'm going to try to make it out there at some point. So oh, at some point, there's going to be a part two. Yeah, definitely comment below and you know do all the thing, and we'll see if we can. If we can, you know, arrange that. But I would love to come out there and actually see stuff in person and like, oh, let's, yeah. let's shred the data. Let's do the consulting thing and figure right. it out. Right. You know, and it's really cool having such a powerful machine. You know, it makes you normally when you want to reanalyze something, you know, you change something in the code and then you have to wait a week to see if what you did works or not. And with this system, we're not going to have to do that. So it's going to, you know, joking aside, it's really going to speed up, literally speed up both the data processing, but also the analysis. It's it's such a it's so cool. Yeah, both sockets are I, I think you'll be able to do your real time processing as normal 
but also when you have an algorithm change that can be running in the background because you know you have months of data and that's still going to take a while to process but it's not going to interfere with the daily processing yeah. and this chassis because it's got so much pci express connectivity you can also expand the physical disk storage so you can have inexpensive you know locally attached storage we did our garbage server build and you could use something like that to add another, you know, 48, three and a half inch bays. And that'll get you in the petabyte range with some reasonably sized hard drives. Yeah. And that's local attached storage. So it's automatically really fast. You can do stuff over, over the network, of course, too. That's just more interconnects. But also FPGAs and GPUs at some point in the future. It's like you, you've got to invent the algorithm on the CPUs. You've got to do the, uh, the inventing and the hard thinking with general purpose compute. You can't do it until... You figure out what you need with something specialized like a GPU. And that's why these things are so critical to research scientists. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, people, my colleagues are starting to develop all these machine learning techniques and all these these cool applications that we can use GPUs for. So the chassis is going to, it's going to do it all. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really is going to be my one stop shop. Um, <laughs> I no it's longer like I have, have to buy these really powerful desktops. You know, I can get <laughs> my, my fancy iMac or whatever and, uh, <laughs> and just zoom into it. It's going to be great. Yeah, it'll be able to run all of their jobs as well. I mean, you know, you might have an office award for the person that comes up with a job that actually bogs the server down. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not a bad one. We could do that competition. I think uh, our IT guys have joked that I think I've got the single most powerful machine Probably in northern Arizona, maybe. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be really cool. Well, Epic is definitely going to bring home the bacon. There's no doubt about that. So I'll, it'll be interesting to do the follow up. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. It's been awesome. Any uh, parting words of wisdom? Any anything you want to check out? The Lowell Observatory is linked below, and you can check out the research. Maybe maybe kick them a few bucks. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of yeah, awesome stuff. Know. We're a, a nonprofit research organization. You know, we're doing the best we can in these trying times. Um, our tours have just started back up. So if you find yourself coming through Northern Arizona, Lowell.edu, and you can book yourself onto a tour. Um, a huge thank you to you and the guys at Gigabyte for making this happen. It's, it's beyond amazing. Um, I'm so thrilled with how it's all worked out. Oh, and AMD and Keoxia. I called yeah. in a lot of favors really to get this thing up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to learn but, some bargaining from you. <laughs> well, it's it's pretty easy when you're a nonprofit because you can use the magic words tax write-off. And then, right. you know, all of a sudden all the doors open and, and it's sort of magical. But, yeah, you know, Lowell Observatory, check them out. I really love the, the work that's being done. And it is really exciting to think about the next, you know, uh, uh, what I always say extrasolar Earth, but it's, uh, what do you guys call it? We just shortened it to exoplanet. Um, uh, yeah. So, you know, Earth-like exoplanet is kind of how we say it in the biz. The next Earth-like exoplanet could okay. be found by AMD Epic and this machine. That is pretty bananas. So it's really awesome to have the opportunity to work on this. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. I've really, this has been a great project. It's been a ton of fun. And this is just the beginning, too. So I'm looking forward to, to more of these. Excellent. Well, once again, I want to thank AMD and Gigabyte for their awesome support on this project. I love working with nonprofits. If you've got something that you want to do, you know, reach out. Maybe we can work something out. It's been really great. Special thanks to Keoxia for their flash storage array. I'm sure this isn't the first time we're going to see this uh, monster beast Gigabyte chassis in server videos because it's pretty much the chassis to have in a hyper-converged infrastructure. I mean, it does everything. Be sure to check out the Lowell Observatory, check out their mission, uh, maybe kick them a few bucks. They are a nonprofit after all. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forums.